We are very excited and pleased to have with us our state representative, Kathy Rapp. So please give her a warm round of applause. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. I was just at uh, your school district doing uh, mock interviews with students, and that was uh, very rewarding. It's always rewarding talking to students about what they have in mind for their future plans. And um, so it was very interesting. <clears throat> you know, some wonderful young people in this community. As like every community, you know, it's our young people that we look, uh, look to to <laughs> carry on, keep our communities uh, going in the future. So to hear that our young people here in Titusville have some really great ideas for their career plans is pretty exciting and very rewarding. And it's um, just wonderful to meet some of them and hear uh, what their ideas are coming from uh, the small uh, community of Titusville. And they have ideas and are motivated uh, to make sure that they have careers and become contributing citizens. So it, it was a, a wonderful experience uh, this morning. Um, I don't know what um, uh, you, if you had any ideas of what I would be speaking on today. To be quite honest with you, I've been on the road quite a bit just the last couple of weeks. Uh, I made uh, three twi trips to Harrisburg just uh, last week, uh, coming home uh, from Harrisburg, then going back down over the weekend, uh, coming home, and then returning on Sunday. So a lot of my time <laughs> has been spent on the road. And of course, this morning, I left my house at quarter to seven to be at your school district. So, But uh, after I uh, just talk a little bit about myself and just share very briefly about the budget and where we are in the process, I'd be more than happy. You have ideas on your, on your mind, maybe questions that you'd like to ask me. So I'd be more than happy just to have this be more of an informal setting where you can ask me questions and hopefully I'll have an answer. If I don't have the answer, uh, we can certainly work with you to get an answer to your question. So uh, currently, um, uh, I, this is my 13th year uh, as a legislator, uh, serving the 65th legislative district, which encompasses all of Warren County, where I am from. I live outside of Warren on one of the hilltops and have a small farm with two horses. Uh, so um, my neighbors actually do most of my farming for me. I pay them to do that. I don't have a tractor or anything, but I do have two horses and a hay field. So, uh, and uh, several grandchildren that live in the area, so they help me out a little bit while I'm gone. Um, I can't hear me. Uh, that's that's better. Is that better? Let me adjust this a little bit. Can everybody else hear me over there? All right. I don't see. How, I'll, I'll just get down closer to the mic. I'm a, I'm kind of tall, so I'm bending over. Currently, I serve on the Education Committee. I'm the subcommittee chair of the, uh, special education. I serve on Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness. So I do a lot of work uh, uh, for uh, veterans and our fire departments. Veterans are a very high priority for me. I served uh, uh, as a military wife and part of a military uh, family for several years. My oldest daughter uh, served uh, in the Army. Uh, actually served in Bosnia during the war there in Bosnia. She was a captain in the Army. And uh, I also serve on um, environmental resources and energy, which is a very important uh, uh, committee for our area here. But in my past life, um, I was a stay-at-home mom. And uh, then one of my children, uh, due to his circumstances, I became an advocate for people with disabilities and served in that capacity for many years. I worked under a grant program under the federal government with the Parent Education Network, which was a parent training center for parents in Pennsylvania. And that was a statewide job. And I worked out of Warren, a satellite office. And we lost that grant. And then I worked in a, um, as a, the uh, administrator uh, for Beverly Healthcare, which is now Golden Living. I was the admissions and um, uh, marketing person for them for almost two years. Uh, didn't really have a lot of direct contact uh, with the uh, 
uh, actually our, our consumers, but uh, as far as being in the facility and working with families and working with the nurses and everyone, it was uh, a very good experience for me in uh, being a legislator and a lot of what we do in the legislation. Uh, one of the other things that I do in the legislature, I have been the pro-life caucus chair for uh, last session and this session. I am the prime sponsor of the major pro-life bill from last session, which was House Bill 1948, and this session, which is House Bill 77. We have a companion bill this year, Senate Bill 3, um, and I've been proud to serve in that capacity. I also serve on other caucuses, but that is the one that I am the chair of. As you know, we are in the budget process, and the House just uh, passed this week, House Bill 218. Uh, the total spend number is around $31 billion, which is less than what the governor proposed. There are many issues going on this year legislatively and administratively from the governor. He's wanting to merge several agencies um, and has wanted more money for education, which is typical for any budget. And so far in the House bill, we've included $100 million more dollars for um, K through 12, the general fund uh, budget for education, and uh, 25 million more for special education. Uh, we've cut a lot in this budget. Some people are happy with that, some are not. I am a fiscal conservative, and I am also socially conservative. And um, you know, the only way for us to get more revenue is to look at uh, legalizing and taxing, usually what we call the vices. Gambling um, uh, is something that we're looking at expanding. I have been a no on expanding gambling. Uh, they're looking at um, internet gambling as a source of revenue, which I've been pretty much opposed to. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, most people who are included in the line item of any state budget uh, the belief is that everybody deserves an increase every year and instead of controlling spending. You know, the state budget is just like your household budget. You have so much revenue and you have so much to pay out. And hopefully at the end of the day, uh, that balances out. But for most of us the, these days with uh, credit and we're spending more than what we earn and the state is in the same position. One of the biggest issues that we are facing in, this, in the state as far as our budget is the pension crisis. Um, I have signed on to every pension bill that has come up. Our uh, state employees, uh, we wanna make sure that the people who are receiving a pension, the people who are working right now are, are going to receive the pension that they have been promised. We have wanted over the last several sessions to change the pension to a defined contribution instead of a defined benefit for just new employees. And we've had a tremendous pushback uh, from uh, government unions mostly and the administration. And so we have not been able to do that. And the pension uh, every year goes further and further in debt uh, to where we have been at the point and we are at the point where our pension sy system could collapse. So when we do legislation and introduce legislation to change defined benefit to define contribution, we have been looking strictly at new employees not current retirees, and not current employees, but for new employees. And even with that, we've been met with much resistance. So uh, those are some of the major issues that I see and continue to see that have been on our plate for uh, several years. And ma'am, you have a question? Uh, 
Well, personally, um, I'm not too fond of that. And I know that there are a lot of legislators who are not too fond of that. So our secretary of, or not our, our chairman of aging in the house and our chairman of health and our chairman of human services. All three chairmen are going, are in the process of conducting hearings. This was uh, uh, an idea from the administration. Now there are legislators who think that's, who thinks that would be a good idea to save the state money. I don't know if that is actually going to s save the state money, but it's definitely uh, worthwhile looking into, and I would like to wait, really, uh, until after we have the hearings. And this was a proposal from the governor. Uh, nothing set in stone yet. Um, we're, uh, our, our budget from the House somewhat reflects that, but typically, when the budget starts in the House, which it usually does, uh, it is now over in the Senate, and the Senate uh, will probably, in my opinion, uh, look at increasing some of those line items. So as far as what the governor proposed, as far as those mergers, I think it's gonna be part of the budget process, and when we hear back from those committees and what is recommended, uh, from the committees after they have their hearings and hearing from constituents all across the state of Pennsylvania. I know Representative Baker, who is from Tioga County, was having some of the agencies from his own county uh, come down to Harrisburg to uh, uh, provide testimony. I am not on any of those committees, uh, but I know the chairman very well, and our caucus will be uh, uh, receiving uh, updates from those chairmen uh, to see if they think that this is doable and is in the best interest uh, for uh, our constituents across the state of Pennsylvania. I have concerns. Uh, I, I will say that. I'm, I'm not so sure that this is a, a good road to go down. Uh, so I, I don't know where I'm gonna stand as, if we are able to vote this or to support the governor. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh yes, ma'am. I have. I've had. I've had people come in uh, uh, my office in in Warren, uh, letters to Harrisburg, and I'm more than happy to sit down uh, when I'm here in the district. If people want to talk to me further uh, and make an appointment uh, in my uh, Titusville office it, it, with a smaller group, when we get updates, I'm more than happy to to listen. Uh, the consensus is that everybody's opposed. Okay. As far as the constituency right. and the agencies themselves, I have not heard from any agency as of now that is uh, in support of the plan. Yes, ma'am. So you, you said that your constituency does not favor this merger. From the people that I've heard from. That doesn't mean the people that I haven't heard from. So, uh, so and you mm -hmm. work for the people Yes, ma'am. Do, don't you feel an obligation to pursue uh, voting against this since they say we don't want it? The people who elect you and pay your wages say we don't want it. Don't you feel that you should vote against it? As of now, ma'am, I, I think I stated that I am not in favor, uh, but <coughs> as a legislator, <coughs> Uh, we are in a process, so as that process, those hearings uh, go on, uh, we have to listen. We have to take the recommendations from uh, our chairman, um, but you're absolutely right, and I'm still listening to my constituents, and most of what my constituents are saying is that they are not in favor. So what you're saying is I may vote for it or I may not, but I'm not going to say until that moment. Is that what you're saying? I'm waiting to hear. We're just starting this process of the budget, and this was just proposed by the governor in his address. And this is a time for the people to weigh in. And uh, as I said, 
Most people that I have talked to, and even myself, as of now, I have grave reservations about it. Um, now, how it's all going to play out, I can't answer that. Uh, if it comes to where there's legislation that would prevent the governor from merging these agencies, if we actually have the opportunity to vote, uh, I'm waiting to see what the outcome of those hearings are, waiting to have the conversation with Representative Baker, Representative Jean D. Geronimo, and uh, Representative Hennessy. And as, as of now, I have had um, a conversation with Representative Baker more than the other two chairmen, and he is the chairman of health, the health committee. And he is not in favor uh, uh, of, the, of the merger as of today. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of my own personal interests is trying to get people jazzed up about the school district where I unfortunately live, which is the Corey Area School District, a very sad story. And to try to get anybody involved, even at that local level, is hard. Uh, so getting them to come to a board meeting is tough. Uh, however, my question relates to your speaking of hearings being scheduled. Mm -hmm. Are hearings happening right now? I believe there were. Uh, I, w I believe there were hearings yesterday. And if a person were so motivated, I don't have gas money to get to Harrisburg. But, uh, Usually they are recorded. Uh, if you would call my Titusville office, the staff, or my uh, phone number in Harrisburg is seven one seven seven eight seven one three six seven. And uh, my staff person in Harrisburg uh, probably has the information more readily and could give you the times when those would be aired on PCN. Are online? Yes. You should be able to you should be able to see them through PCN or even through the house website. Okay. And and she could give you that information. My uh, person's name in Harrisburg is Lori Clark. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Most of us are not qualified for Medicaid, and we'd like to continue to have the services that can promise that. Uh, when we talk about Medicaid, uh, I will share with you that the biggest part of the pie of Medicaid is long-term care. So when we're talking long-term care, we're usually talking seniors, uh, the elderly, and um, Unfortunately, not everyone has long-term care disability insurance. So if you do not and you need uh, nursing home care, skilled nursing home care, then you uh, would need to apply for Medicaid that pays for long-term care if you do not have the private insurance. And I think most of us know that long-term care is very expensive and the rates are climbing every day. I, work, having worked in long-term care, um, believe it or not, there's uh, many people at that stage of their life, I think the, the look back time now is five years, so you can sign everything over to your children. I would encourage you to do it. I've started the process myself of at least putting someone on your deed in your family, and uh, you would be surprised. Uh, with the cost of long-term care. Even if you have a lot of savings and whatever, um, it doesn't take long to use up all of that money. And so uh, the state is faced with providing, you know, for our seniors and our elderly at that stage of their life, but that is the, the, the biggest growing component of Medicaid is long-term care. <coughs> Yes, ma'am. At some point, I, I work in the medical field, and I see a lot of people come in with the gold card, so to speak. And are there no limitations as to the, handing these out to young people? I mean, I, are I, what, what do you, are there what? Like stipulations to, to apply for these medical, these medical assistance programs and that 
for the young? I mean, are there no other problems, no other, nothing else available to them but welfare if they need help? Well, that is part of the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, that everybody should be covered under health insurance, so that if, if you don't work in a uh, position where your employer is providing you with uh, health care, health care insurance, then there, if you met, meet the income guidelines, then you would be eligible for a medical card. And that would fall back. Yeah, and unfortunately, we are seeing, I think one state uh, is totally collapsing under the Affordable Care Act. They have no provider. So I know where I live, I think there's four providers for, for medical assistance. Uh, but that varies from what I understand. I'm not an expert. Congressman Thompson would be the best person to invite here and talk about the Affordable so Care Act. Yes, I am, not, I am not an expert on the Affordable Care Act or what Congress has plans in as far as any revisions to that plan. Um, but uh, uh, as far as being eligible, it is by income, whether or not you receive insurance from your employer. Yes, ma'am. Concerning this consolidation, where, what will you do with them? If we are opposed to it and we're telling you and we're stating in the letter and the postcards what we're against and what we don't want, what will you do with those postcards and letters? Well, certainly I will look at them and um, I do take those into consideration on how uh, my constituency feels about different issues. I, I am not a person that uh, I'm, I'm pretty independent, okay, for, as to how I vote. I, I, I don't owe our leadership, you know, really much of anything because I'm not beholden to them. So I, and I think most of your uh, legislators in the Northwest are in that same position. Uh, we are pretty much independent when we're, in, when we're in Harrisburg as far as how we want to vote on an issue. I don't have leadership coming and twisting my arm to vote a certain way. And, you know, and that, that has been tried, I'll be honest, on different issues. I remember back to the transportation bill, uh, but I, I was a no vote. I just did not feel that um, everybody wants repairs to the roads and the bridges. I understand that, I get that, but I didn't feel that rural PA could afford uh, the higher gas taxes. And I've been, you know, at the gas station when people were struggling to put a dollar, two dollars, three dollars in their gas tank to get to work. And I, you know, we are in an area, we don't have mass transportation where, uh, or even subsidized mass transportation. Most of us, if we're, you know, we have a job and we have to drive to work, we're putting, we're driving up to you know, a gas station and putting fuel in a car to get to and from work or to the grocery store or wherever. Um, so I'm uh, pretty mindful of my constituents. I do represent rural Pennsylvania and, you know, I'm a rural Pennsylvania. I think I have a pretty good handle on uh, the beliefs of my constituents here. Um, and if I voted no, does that mean it's going to pass or fail? Um, I, I can't answer that. Uh, I, I can't answer for what's going to happen tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. In, in the follow-up to her question, so as letters come in or calls come in to your district offices, are, is your staff instructed to keep a tally of that? Yes. You could say 70% are not in favor, 30% think it's great. I pretty much know when I get 150 postcards uh, and they all read the same uh, that uh, where people stand. And I try to take a look at that as a percentage of the people, you know, who've also, as far as out of 60 some thousand people and not all of them 18 and over, you know, what, the, what does that represent? So, well, like yes. 
I don't know what's going on in a quarry school well, district. I'm just telling you, you're dealing with apathy on most people's part because they're working hard every day. Absolutely. They don't have time to, or sometimes even the desire to get involved politically. So for the folks who do make an effort to get involved, clearly you've hit a passion button for them. Oh, absolutely. And we have issues like this all the time. And I don't know if it's school funding you're referring to or what it is. I mean, I, I, uh, live in Warren County, uh, which is a consolidated school district. We have one administration for the entire county. Same with Forest. I also have Titusville, and you know, I would, I'll be honest, I would like to see more consolidation of school districts by county in this state, because I do think that that is one thing that saves taxpayer dollars. If uh, because you're looking at one administration, is it, is it all perfect? No, but I, you know, we're such, we are in such a decline of population. When I, I graduated from Warren Area High School, my class had around 500 students. Now there's around 400 students for the entire county. And I don't think, and I think it's the same in Crawford County, from what I hear, that our, we're all in a population decline, our schools are in population decline, and I do feel that's one way school districts across, you know, Pennsylvania, and it's not just the Northwest, it's everywhere, that we should be looking at some type of consolidation, uh, at least consolidating at administrative level. I, oh, absolutely, and I understand the fact that in uh, representing a rural district that it's tough for people to uh, be engaged. I mean, you're talking about school districts, you, and even with working families, or even if you're retired, you have other things on your mind. You're busy, uh, working families, they're busy trying to, you know, put food on the table, and uh, unless you really have a, a burning issue, that's when people typically become more involved in the, in the political arena, is when you see an issue um, that's come about, whether it's the Affordable Care Act and what's going to happen to my benefits or long-term care or school district issues, then that's usually when people just say, hey, I'm going to get involved. My school's closing. I think I better go to a school board meeting. But if things are going along well in your life and you don't really see any challenges, um, then you have a tendency to kind of ignore, ignore what's going on politically. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I probably have more comments than I do questions. That's fine. It's kind of to tie together some of the things I've heard. Um, you mentioned the fact that uh, we are rural. We do have a decline in population. We do, um, you know, a couple of those things. And as that relates to, you know, the services, the, the services that the lottery fund um, provides to the individuals in our area. So I think we can all agree that the majority of the people we are losing are not those that are over 60, clearly. They, they are our younger generations that are going away, which puts our rural seniors even at, at higher risk because, you know, clearly we're not like Philly, we're not like Pittsburgh. We don't have Thank God. all the time right next door that can check on us or knock on their doors. And just, you know, um, as, as, you know, kind of a, an informational side of things, just in the last three years in Crawford County, our, uh, our level of, of service for individuals for home delivered meals has increased 100%. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I think our meals are, are just fine and they are nutritionally uh, balanced, but they are clearly not gourmet meals. People don't go, oh, I can hardly wait till I turn 60. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, to me, that shows, you know, the significance of the need and, and the fact that the rural nature of our location and the declining population of younger individuals around to support our older citizens is not is not there anymore, which brings about the greater need for these lottery funded services. The, and the lottery funded services do not um, serve those who qualify for Medicaid. They, they typically catch those individuals who, you know, don't make enough to completely support themselves yet, um, don't make, or make too much to qualify for Medicaid. And I think you're also speaking to, you know, 
a room full of, of people who are probably also very fiscally conservative. And everyone here, and I, I, I don't mean to speak for everyone, but I'm sure, and I see people nodding their heads, they agree that when there are cost savings to be had, that is certainly a good avenue to take. However, <laughs> when you're talking tax dollars versus lottery dollars, and the commingling of those that may lead to, to a more rapid depletion of the lottery fund, maybe that's not the best way to do it. As well as, there are certainly functions that could be consolidated without consolidating those departments if you truly really want to save money and you truly really want to be able to um, have an impact on the general fund. IT functions, HR functions, just to name a few. Those things could absolutely be, be consolidated in some way without the consolidation of those whole agencies. And I think you probably wouldn't get a whole lot of pushback about that kind of mm -hmm. thing because it makes sense and it, it's something that everybody can, can wrap their yeah. around. So and, and in reality, um, the governor laid out the idea, but he didn't lay out the details. Right. So. As somebody who watches these hearings, it, there are no details. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I have said this uh, to a few of my representatives that I've talked to, but, and I'll say it to you. I know about two people in the course of my lifetime that I would trust with a blank check, right? So they're, they're essentially asking you for a blank check to, to sign off on this consolidation without knowing truly what it looks mm -hmm. like and how it impacts your constituency. And I would hand a blank check to a lot of people because I'm accountable then for whatever numbers they fill in there. Right? Absolutely, and that's why the chairmen are having hearings. Right. Uh, because uh, uh, as representatives, which we all are in the House, um, the chairman believes, the chairmen believe that they need to hear from the people across Pennsylvania. They need to hear what the people themselves think about this issue instead of just jumping on board right away with the governor. We need to know how, how our people perceive this merger. And uh, people who work in the trenches, in the agencies, usually have a much better, better handle on how this is going to affect um, the people that you work with um, more than we know because you're working uh, and the, the agency people are working on a day-to-day -day basis and that's why we have the hearings to hear uh, how the agency people see this and how the people that they are serving see this issue and what impact you believe negative or positive it's going to have and right now I don't have that information until I receive that information from the chairman after the hearing. What are the pros and cons? That's what we didn't hear from that from the governor, really. Um, he's looking at cost-saving measures uh, for the state. He knows that after two years that the legislature is not going to just hand over $12 billion to him to spend the way he wanted like he originally planned. If anybody remembers clearly, like I do, his first year when we didn't have a budget till December, and he still didn't sign it, he just let it uh, go the 10 days and it became law. Actually, it wasn't until that March. Um, so I think he's finally realized after two years, he cannot come to the General Assembly and ask us for two, three billion dollars and just expend, expect us to give him a blank check from the taxpayers. So it is re a responsible action by the committee chairman to conduct these hearings. So uh, if you send me postcards, if you send me letters, I certainly can direct them to one of those three chairmen and say, this is what my constituents are saying. Please take this into consideration when you make your recommendations to uh, all of the House members. Yes, ma'am. They have to remember, too, that we're the ones that voted them in. We oh, we all, we, I, I'm very uh, cognizant of that, ma'am. <laughs> yes. You mentioned it, David, I, I believe, a little bit earlier um, today, and you mentioned right now the fact that, you know, all the savings that the, gov that the governor is saying I'm certain. 
certainly not the, I don't know all the numbers, right? I'm coming in, in the distance just to try to feel my way through it. But from my understanding, it's pretty much been proven that money wouldn't not to be safe. Is this really being conveyed to the governor appropriately? Um. I, I, I really can't I really can't answer that at yeah. this point in time uh, what I can say to you is that we're trying to give the governor a little bit of leeway until we have the hearings and see what the uh, people from across Pennsylvania uh, both people who receive the services and people who are responsible for those services say I guess what I'm saying is are we Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Not, not me. Um, prepare to show those dollar amounts that it really isn't. Usually, when people um, agree to come to a hearing, a large part of those of their testimony is going to be about those dollar amounts. Absolutely. Just back on your letters, Matt, then you are committed. If we send you letters and postcards to get them into the right hands, the chairman or whoever, that will help. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing that we do uh, during, which you don't see because we have caucus meetings, which are not open to the public, and it's it's a it's a time we go over every piece of legislation uh, that we are going to vote on in our respective caucus meetings. Whether you, you, if you're a Democrat, you have a Democrat caucus. If you're a Republican, you have a Republican caucus. So before we vote on any bill, uh, we have a caucus meeting and we discuss uh, the pros and cons of that bill, just like the budget. And uh, this, this budget right now is in the very starting phase. Now it's in the Senate. So uh, this is really uh, the legislative uh, process uh, after the governor uh, came to us and delivered his budget plan. Then we had uh, general hearings from every agency, but now we will have specific hearings uh, addressing these mergers. And so uh, we will be discussing that in our respective caucuses, the pros and cons. And that is um, uh, a time when we as legislators, and we at any time can go to our speaker, our majority leader, or any of our chairman, and weigh in on how our constituents and, and uh, how any piece of legislation is going to affect the 65th legislative district or districts you know, across the state. This is a, a very diverse state. Um, so rural legislators usually have, most of the time, not all of the time, uh, different perspectives on how things are going to impact uh, our, our districts. So I expect a lot of legislators to weigh in on this issue. And, um, uh, but I cannot predict where this is all, I cannot. I, I can tell you I have grave concerns about it myself, but I can't predict the outcome. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that there is a, a, a agreement among the members of the assembly to get the budget passed on time? Ma'am, we have had a budget on the governor's desk on time, I think just about every year that I've served in the legislature. Now, the process is the governor comes into a joint session, the Senate comes into the House chamber, he delivers his address. Then the Senate and the House have budget hearings. The next process is for the House uh, to come up with a budget, which we just passed. It's basically what we call a vehicle because it's kind of, I, I suppose you could say one of the steps, uh, but we have to put together what we call the line item where everything is in the budget is done line by line and the dollar amounts are there. We send that over to the Senate. Now, uh, our job is to have a budget on the governor's desk by June 30th. And we are committed to doing that. We've done it all of um, uh, Wolf's terms and uh, we will have that done this year, but it, his, it is his decision on whether or not to sign that budget. He can veto out line in, in Pennsylvania. He has what we call line item veto, or he can blue line something, 
or he can wait 10 days and let it go into law without signing it. Those are his options. If he sends it, if he doesn't veto it, we have the option of trying to override, but that is very difficult because an override vote in the House and in the Senate is a two-thirds vote. So that is difficult. We don't have um, two-thirds uh, Republicans where the Republicans could do it alone. We would need um, some Democrats to override a budget, but you know, when you're in the minority and the governor is your party, you have a tendency to stick with your governor no matter what. So it's kind of like what's going on in the Senate right now as far as uh, um, our Supreme Court justice and the confirmation hearings. So uh, an override is difficult. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming in and speaking thank to you. us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank I you. Will see you Senator Tuck Bay. Thank you. And uh, uh, if any of you do want to speak with me, you know, more in depth or at my office, you're more than welcome. Uh, I do, when I come down to Titusville, it's usually a, a tight schedule. So if you want to make an appointment to do that, or if you don't have to come alone, you can come with a group, uh, whatever you prefer, or we can meet elsewhere too. So I'm more than happy to uh, meet with you and come down and, and talk again about any issue. Thank you. Thank you for having me.